hard copy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Remember, O most chaste spouse of the Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto you, my spiritual Father, and beg your protection. O foster Father of the Redeemer, despise not my petitions, but in your goodness hear and answer me. Amen. Heavenly Father, on this day 27, we come to you again asking you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we discover in St. Joseph the pillar of families. And as we also discover how the silence of St. Joseph and his hiddenness is now coming to light and he himself is speaking to us uh, because you desire him to be more known and loved. Pour out your spirit upon us so that we can uh, discern these things well and respond to every grace you desire to give us. And as always, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, my friends, so I, I started a little early tonight, uh, not the timing, but I got on a few minutes before the official start because I wanted to make sure that the Facebook one was set up right. Evidently, yesterday, I was... Uh, half of my face was showing on the Facebook version. I'm so sorry about that. I didn't realize that. As I say, it's the laptop is the YouTube one. It's gigantic right in front of, in front of me. The phone is just a little tiny thing here. So I'm sorry for that, guys. My bad. Um, so it looks like we're good to go now. And maybe I should have been doing it like this the whole time because I'm looking at my phone right now. And um, I think that looks pretty good. And I apologize for the last 27 days. Only yesterday, I think you saw half my face. The rest of it, I think you saw me, but I was always like way on the edge. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so that's the only thing from yesterday um, that I needed to cover. And we got a lot of stuff to go through today. Um, I was saying right before we started that we could probably be here for a couple hours tonight uh, because of the material. It's really good stuff. It's really good stuff. So um, we're not going to be here for two hours, but... Um, it's really important, some of the things we're going to go through. Okay, so day 27, the title from the Litany of St. Joseph, Pillar of Families, pray for us. So I start with a quote from St. Teresa of Avila, and she said, Those who are devoted to prayer should, in a special manner, cherish devotion to St. Joseph. I know not how anyone can ponder on the sufferings trials and tribulations the queen of angels endured whilst caring for Jesus in his childhood without at the same time thinking saint thinking thanking saint joseph for the services he rendered the divine child and his blessed mother nailed it nailed it and that was a long time ago when uh this doctor of the church saint teresa of avila said that and I, you know i have to say to myself anyway you know in my study and my research of this even after she made that statement and did so much to make St. Joseph known, I can't really say that the church on a huge level took that up and really went with that and, and included St. Joseph in so many other um, aspects of the devotional life of the church, uh, here and there, maybe, but not really as a whole. And I think that that's why right now, I think uh, St. Teresa of Avila, looking down on us now from, you know, uh, her place in, in you know, with our God, um, probably would be very happy because of all that's going on. She's probably like, finally, they're getting it, you know? <laughs> so um, I don't mean to put words in the m mouth of the saints. I hope they don't mind. But um, that's that's what I would say. Anyway, if I was St. Teresa of Avila, finally, you guys, about time. All right. So let me just read a few things to you here. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph love families. Their three hearts are very concerned about what is happening to families today. Families are falling apart. Modern man has distanced himself from God and attempted to redefine what it means to be a family. This is all over the place. As a result, divorce rates are at an all-time high. The majority of married couples use contraception. Abortion is legal. And it is socially acceptable for children to be raised by two dads and or two moms. How messed up is that? The family stands on the edge of a great precipice. 
a great precipice. Now, I'm going to read a quote to you from St. John Paul II because, you know, sometimes people today, they may think of someone like me who's, you know, radical for the Lord, but they might interpret some of the things that I say or the way that I say it. Oh, he's just like a conspiracy guy, man. He's like, you know, he's like everybody's out to get him. And look, I'm not like that. But I definitely think that there is um, something at play in the world, even through major organizations around the world that are trying to break down um, traditional marriage, trying to break down society and basically rewrite everything, um, change history. You know, I mean, really, there's a major thing going on here. But at the heart of it is the family and marriage. Because if you can redefine that, the building blocks of civilization, you can pretty much write the rewrite the book. Uh, and that's what's going on. And we got major players with tons of money, influence, uh, and fame even to, uh, at work seeking to do this. But in case you think I'm a conspiracy theorist, let's let me read this quote to you from St. John Paul II. Remember, this is the vicar of Jesus Christ. Uh, when he was the Pope here. This is what he says. Various programs backed by very powerful resources nowadays seem to aim at the breakdown of the family. At times, it appears that concerted efforts are being made to present as normal and attractive and even to glamorize situations which are in fact irregular. Indeed, they contradict the truth and love which should inspire and guide relationships between men and women, thus causing tensions and divisions in families with grave consequences, particularly for children. The moral conscience becomes darkened. What is good, true, and beautiful is deformed, and freedom is replaced by what is actually enslavement. Ay ay ay. So what's he talking about there? Oh, you got your George Soros, you got your World Health Organization, you got your Planned Parenthood, you got tons of famous people in Hollywood. Really? You got your Bill Gates. Tons, tons of major players right now with influence, money, and fame who are trying to basically redefine everything and create humanity as they would like to see it, as they would like to see it. Now, I think this has probably been going on, you know, from the beginning, you know, the devil messing everything up, of course, but the devil is very much at work right now still uh, with many of these people who are, you know, radically against the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, I hope you're aware of this. I hope you're not like Father Calloway. I mean, you got to be living on like Pluto, bro, if you're not aware of what's going on, you know? Okay. So St. Paul, John Paul II is absolutely correct. God established the family to be a school of love, something beautiful, delightful, and life-giving. And the devil and his agents want to destroy it. Devil's got a lot of agents today, a lot of agents. How are we ever going to turn the situation around? How can we we return to order? The only way is to elevate the holy family as the model and blueprint of the family. When the Holy Family is celebrated in society, we will again know the sanctity of motherhood, the heroism of fatherhood, and the blessing of children. I remember when uh, one of the editors for the book and a theologian with a doctorate from the Angelicum in Rome, he read that one last sentence I just read, and he said, Father, that sentence right there is worth the book. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty good sense. <laughs> you know, I mean, I sound a little arrogant there. I didn't mean it in that way. But, you know, it, the truth, when you hear the truth, it just, it's refreshing. It's refreshing. And it shines a light on the falsehoods and the darknesses. And this is what we know that we're dealing with right here is in the world today is a lot of darknesses, you know, a lot of, a lot of bad things. St. Joe, oh, I must jump, went back to the opposite page. St. Joseph wants to be the pillar of your family. A pillar is a foundation. Remember, if you don't have a pillar holding things up, everything collapses. That's why we see in our current situation, 
in the world that things are collapsing. And people, you know, a lot of people don't see this. They want the collapse. They are intentionally desiring and aiming for the collapse because they want to rebuild everything as, as they want it. Um, and what's at the root of this again? The, the deconstruction, the deformation of family as the cell block of everything. You take that away, everything just collapses. And especially when you take away the importance of fathers in the family or even the importance of fathers in the church. You know, so you just, father gets replaced by a gazillion lay people in sanctuary. The father just doesn't feel he's, he's been emasculated. What do I do? Gosh, I went to seminary for college four years and, you know, four years of seminary. And here I am now choosing a life of celibacy, which is not easy, but I, I want the greater good, the salvation of souls. And basically now everybody's doing my job. Can't confect the sacraments, of course, at least not the Eucharist and confession. But, you know, seriously, when you emasculate men, whatever their fatherhood is, whether it's in sacramental marriage or in the priesthood, guys are just like, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure, you know, where my place is here. And so now in society, I mean, you've got what, what's the presentation of men, whether priest or even married men in most TV shows today, sitcoms and so forth. That they're basically just um, goofballs. Goofballs with no real manners or virtue. They're just a bunch of slobs that the ladies laugh at, people make fun of, even their own children laugh at. Really, this is the presentation of families. It's been going on for quite a while now. And in, in what most people sit around watching on a daily basis for, you know, four to five hours, the TV set. And so this is what, you know, we've come to. No wonder we're seeing the collapse of civilization and societies and, and, and all of that. Because this is the presentation of the family that's been given, right? Even modern family, you know, TV show, which is so messed up. So messed up, man. But this is, you know, what we're dealing with here. I mean, you know, I love to watch some of those old movies where men were heroes, and they saved the day and they, they, they defended and died for the good, the true and the beautiful. Or the movies, you know, 1940s or 50s or whatever, where the priests were the priests were gentlemen and they were the one that people came to for for moral guidance. And they were they were Renaissance men in the sense of they, you know, were intelligent, articulate. And yet, you know, they have a little scotch. And at the same time, they could play the piano and they could also change a tire. These were all around men. But now the presentation of a priest on TV, he's just a loser who can't get a girl. And they generally portray priests as effeminate and most likely gay. Really, this is what's been happening. And so we've got this collapse. The pillars have been taken away. You take away the pillars, everything crumbles. That's what we're dealing with. That's actually why we got a lot of problems in the church, too. But I better be careful. Better be careful. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Ba -ba -ba. A pillar is a foundation. In order for your home to stand on a firm foundation and be unshakable, your family needs St. Joseph. He will teach your family the importance of prayer, mutual respect, purity, honesty, forgiveness, love, and most importantly, placing God above all things. Okay, we got a lot of ground to cover in the wonder today. So let's let's go there right now to page 191. It's called Silent Witness. Mm, good stuff. Get ready, my friends. All right, so I start with a quote from uh, St. Pope Paul VI. He says, The gospel does not record a single word from him, St. Joseph. His language is silence. And as we're going to see, there's great holiness in that silence of St. Joseph. The Lord loves this about him because he knows that he can depend upon him uh, in that hiddenness and in that silence. But things seem to be coming to a different phase now with the church and this recognition of St. Joseph so that we're starting to actually hear something about St. Joseph and actually feel from St. Joseph. This is fascinating stuff. All right, so before I start getting into the meat of it, I want to read this really cool quote to you. 
from that blessed William Joseph Chaminade. I remember when I um, found this quote from him in my research, I wasn't sure exactly where to put it in the book. And I was like, gosh, I'm not sure where it should go. So I was just like, I don't know, just put it here. So it could go probably anywhere in the book, but it's a great one. He says, you would think that to protect this precious treasure, Jesus, the omnipotent God would equip him, St. Joseph, with thunderbolts. Wrong. Joseph sees in his arms a fugitive God, and he follows him. He finds consolation only in his submission and in his confidence. Wow, that's so cool. That's just such a, such a great image. Because, see, that's how we think. That's how I would have done it, probably. If entrusting my son into the care of a man who'd be my re representative, I mean, he would have been, like, decked out with all kind of weapons. He'd be looking like Rambo, you know? But that that's the way we do it, or at least the way I would have done it. God doesn't do it that way. God equips St. Joseph with humility and silence. That is powerful weapons right there, my friends. Powerful weapons. St. Joseph never wanted to be in the forefront of the drama of salvation. He preferred to remain hidden. His desire is for all the attention, all the attention, to be given to Jesus and Mary. The silence and humility of St. Joseph are one of a kind, revealing his power, greatness, and influence with God. In the 17th century, Bishop Jacques Bousseau of France extolled the wonders of the silence and humility of St. Joseph. And by the way, there's a lot of people that I, I did not put in the book. Um, I wanted to focus primarily on saints, blesseds, mystics, popes. Um, but there's a lot of other people that I didn't really focus on in the book. Uh, this is one of them, this Bishop Bousseau. There's another one, Jean Gerson, who phenomenal stuff from centuries ago and many others that I didn't put in the book. A lot of their stuff actually isn't in English. It's either generally in French or some other Romance language uh, or Latin. And so um, to do that, I would have had to probably spend years uh, doing the translation and having people help me do the translation. But here's a passage from this uh, Bishop Bousseau. He says, Jesus was revealed to the apostles that they might announce him throughout the world. He was revealed to St. Joseph, who was to remain silent and keep him hidden. The apostles are lights to make the world see Jesus. Joseph is a veil to cover him. And under that mysterious veil are hidden from us the virginity of Mary and the greatness of the Savior of souls. He who makes the apostles glorious with the glory of preaching glorifies Joseph by the humility of silence. Now you might be thinking, okay, cool quote there, but I don't totally get it. All right, well, Bous this Bishop Bousseau says, the greatest thing that we have in Christianity is hidden and silent and veiled. You know what it is, right? If you've read the book, you, you got it. If you haven't read the book, what it, what is it? The Eucharist, hidden presence, silent presence, and veiled, tabernacled. So Joseph, in many ways, is very similar to our Eucharistic Lord. He's hidden. He's silent. And, and veiled, shrouded, you know, in, in, in wonder and mystery. But throughout the centuries, and this has been increasing to the point now where we have these all over the place, the Eucharist has, has become so much appreciated that now we've seen an increase slowly throughout the centuries in Eucharistic adoration. You know, we're blessed to live in the times that we do because back centuries ago, they didn't have like perpetual adoration to the same degree that we have it today. I mean, it's it's all over the place today and praise God for this. See, what was hidden and, and veiled and silent uh, and the greatest treasure of Christianity, Jesus Christ himself, the source and summit of our faith in, 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 in the Blessed Sacrament, is now being exposed for the masses to come to, unveiled, so to speak, and perpetual adoration is being set up all over the place. Probably every diocese in the world now has at least one place of perpetual adoration. Many dioceses now have many places of perpetual adoration, or at least times of adoration in their diocese. This is fantastic. This brings about great renewal, healings, blessings, vocations, all of that. Well, something similar is now taking place over time, with St. Joseph, his hiddenness, 
silence, his being shrouded in mystery, is now becoming more prominent. And it's about to be exposed in a huge way for the good of mankind and for the good of the church. So I'm going to give you one example uh, that was a few centuries ago that not a, people, not a lot of people know about <clears throat> that I didn't know about. Uh, until I did the research for this book, because oftentimes uh, many of these things uh, we're talking about are apparitions of St. Joseph. And uh, you don't really think about him in apparitions. You know, we don't hear about that kind of stuff. We know that Our Lady has been appearing in apparitions from the beginning of the church. I mean, really and truly, as a matter of fact, even while she still was on the earth and the apostles were still here, she was already bilocating. You're aware of that, right? When St. James went to preach and he was, you know, having a difficult time at it and he went to Spain, Our Lady actually, during her life here on earth, bilocated to him uh, to strengthen him, to encourage him. That was the first one of Our Lady, you know, uh, even here on earth, being in two places at the same time. And then after that, there have been so many apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know the more famous ones, but there are lesser known ones as well throughout the centuries. But St. Joseph? No, not, not so much. This is really only a recent thing. Um, and so in the 17th century, so this one, this was a, a while ago, this one I'm going to tell you about now. Uh, on June 7th, 1660, and I'm going to attempt, for me in French, I, I struggle with French. You know, I, a lot of other languages I can read and pronounce, but French, you always get stuff on the end that you don't pronounce, and I don't even know why it's there. So I'm not sure how to pronounce this one. I think it's Coltinac or something like that. So in France, St. Joseph appeared to a shepherd, spoke to him, and worked miracles and wonders of healing. Uh, and this is a, an amazing event that took place. So there was this uh, young man, a shepherd named Gaspard, and he was out uh, with his flock and it was very hot and he was extremely thirsty and he didn't know how to quench his thirst. There was nothing around the area. Well, all of a sudden, this man of dignified appearance, he says, appeared to him, pointed to a rock and said to him, I am Joseph. Lift this rock and you shall drink. Now, the rock was extremely heavy. So he was like, I, I can't lift that rock. So the man, you know, said to him again, you know, lift the rock. And so he went over to it, fully believing he wasn't going to be able to do it. And he was able to do it. And then all of a sudden, a spring sprang up of water. And it was the most pure, you know, water. And he was able to, to slake his thirst. And he was in awe that he was able to move that rock and that there was a spring. So he went to town. And he told the people, thinking they were going to laugh at him and mock him, but they were intrigued by it. So they went there, and when they got there, they saw that this rock had been moved, and they heard what the what the shepherd said, and it took another eight men to move the rock further so that more of this spring could be exposed. And they were like, you moved this by yourself? And it took eight grown men to move the rock you know, so that more of the spring could be shown. And then all of a sudden, this Gaspard realized, he said, I am Joseph. I saw St. That was St. Joseph. And it news of this spread everywhere. I mean, everywhere. So as, as word got out about what had taken place, people began to come to the spring from all over France. And many miracles occurred because of the faith of the people. They prayed to God for healing, and God worked wonders through St. Joseph and the miraculous spring. Isn't that interesting? You know, that even before Lourdes, uh, we had this event take place in France. Isn't that fascinating? That, you know, so, you know, uh, the husband and wife do similar things, you know. So they prayed to God for healing, and God worked wonders through St. Joseph and the miraculous spring. The king of France. King Louis XIV heard about what was happening in the village and was deeply impressed. He was so moved that he consecrated all of France to St. Joseph on March 19, 1661, so the following year. He also declared the Feast of St. Joseph a national holiday throughout all of France. Wow. The site quickly became so popular that the local people built a shrine to St. Joseph around the miraculous spring. For over a hundred years, it was a place of great pilgrimage. 
But at the time of the French Revolution, remember, not something to be celebrated, these lunatics took our nuns to the guillotine and, and brought a prostitute into the cathedral of Notre Dame and mocked the Ave Maria. You don't celebrate this, right? The shrine was abandoned and fell into ruins in the French Revolution. It was only restored in 1978, recently, and now is operated by a group of Benedictine nuns. Haven't been there yet. I'd love to go there someday. I went on a pilgrimage to the great shrines of France uh, two years ago, I think. What a phenomenal pilgrimage that was. My goodness, that was one of my favorite ones. It was off the charts. That was such a great pilgrimage. Um, so let me read to you here, uh, getting back to the theme of the silence, because see this, this, he's been shrouded in silence, but, you know, beginning with this particular event and then building, 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 like, like July 4th coming up in the United States, uh, uh you know, people go outside and, they're, you know, they're knocking back a cold one, getting a hamburger and a hot dog. And then the, the, the night shows up and all of a sudden the fireworks start. And there's one, and there's another, and then two, and then boom, and then it just it starts going, and then all of a sudden crescendos with the with the 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 the, the grand finale. See, this is what this is what was happening right now, my friends, when it comes to Saint Joseph. It's been building one one here, one here, maybe two. All right, something's coming, something's coming. So Our Lady said to Saint Bridget of Sweden on one occasion this. Getting back to the whole theme of the holiness of St. Joseph's silence. She said, St. Joseph was so reserved and careful in his speech that not one word ever issued from his mouth that was not good and holy, nor did he ever indulge in unnecessary or less than charitable conversation. He was most patient and diligent in bearing fatigue. He practiced extreme poverty. He was most meek in bearing injuries. He was strong and constant against enemies. He was the faithful witness of the wonders of heaven. Wow, that is so awesome. And now, in modern times, you know, I mentioned this the other day, um, we've had probably two of the greatest female saints of modern times were very close to St. Joseph, St. Therese of Lisieux. And remember, the little flower on day 29, so in just a couple days, we're going to read something about something extraordinary that uh, we would not have the little flower, we would not have the, the you know, the, the little way of Therese of Lisieux had it not been for the intercession of St. Joseph, and she loved, and her parents loved St. Joseph, and then St. Faustina Kowalska, the uh, Secretary of Divine Mercy, uh, she had a great love for St. Joseph. So those two saints have really highlighted in both of their autobiographies, you know, the, the story of a soul and Divine Mercy in my soul, both of them uh, emphasize and talk about the holiness and their relationship with St. Joseph, often overlooked. People who read both of those autobiographies often just bypass that, thinking it's of no significance. It's of huge significance. Okay. However, however, there's somebody greater than Therese of Lisieux and St. Faustina who want to see St. Joseph more known and loved. You know who it is, right? Oh, yes, it's the bride. It's Our Lady, the wife of St. Joseph. She's been doing this from the beginning of the church, by the way. And now she's, she's ooh, it's exploding. We're, we're coming up to the grand finale, I think. Think about it. Centuries ago, Mary was the first person to unveil the greatness of St. Joseph by telling St. Matthew and St. Luke about aspects of the life of St. Joseph of which, which they otherwise would have had no knowledge. St. Matthew and Luke didn't know St. Joseph. They, ne they, they, they never met him. Uh, they were probably about the same age as our Lord or thereabouts. You know, they, they had no knowledge. So where did they get this stuff? Maybe I mentioned this at the beginning of the series. I, I can't remember, but it's an important one because... You know, you got these scholars today who come up with these ideas. Oh, we've got to create a an infancy narrative, and we've got to bring in certain people. So, how do we do this? Oh, here's a here's a Near Eastern myth. You know, some legend about some other deity. Let's borrow that, superimpose our stuff on it, and kind of create one and fudge it. Um, Matthew and Luke didn't fudge it. Okay, this is why Our Lady was left 
after our Lord's resurrection and ascension to teach the apostles and the writers of the Gospels about things that they were clueless about. So it was Our Lady, Our Lady is the reason that St. Joseph is in the New Testament. Well, the Holy Spirit, too, of course, is the Holy Spirit is the primary author working through the writers, you know, of, of, of the four Gospels and the rest, you know, uh, of the New Testament. But it was Our Lady cooperating with the Holy Spirit who spoke up and talked about her husband in various, you know, scenes about the early Holy Family's life. You know, the Annunciation and, and, and then the Annunciation to Joseph uh, and about the presentation about the visitation, those things, where do you think those things came from? They had to come from the Blessed Virgin Mary, because Matthew and Luke, they didn't know Joseph. Okay, uh, cover that. So today, Our Lady, the wife of Joseph, is at it again. She's doing it again, guys. So through her various apparitions, Mary is making her husband known by bringing him with her and teaching the church about his importance. She's been trying to get our attention, actually, about this for quite some time. But now, I mean, the message is getting pretty strong. The Holy Trinity is the one behind it, of course, and primarily so. But there can be no doubt that Mary greatly delight, de delights in it, what the Holy Trinity is doing, and wants it as well. It seems Mary is once again asking Jesus to provide more wine. They have no wine. Give them wine. So she's, she's, she's doing her part to, to make Joseph so much more known and loved. Here's a quote from that blessed Gabriel Allegra. Remember who he is now, the Sicilian priest who went to China and translated the Bible into Chinese and uh, is a, a contemporary. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly when he died, but it might have been in like the late 70s or early 80s, something. So recent, very recent. You can look up the exact date. He said, in our time, our time. So we're talking about our time. Our Lady has helped us comprehend and love her dear and chaste husband, St. Joseph. She has told us of the mystery surrounding him and of his greatness. She has let us know something of her love for St. Joseph, that most lovable saint who for years held the word made flesh in his arms. So what is Blessed Gabrielle Allegra referring to there? How is Our Lady been doing this in, in, in our times? All right. Let's, uh, let's unpack it. So recently, within this era of St. Joseph that I've been talking about, so remember, in 1870, blessed Pope Pius IX proclaimed St. Joseph the patron of the universal church. My friends, when you do something like that, when the Pope, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, makes such a declaration like that, things happen. It has effect. So this is why, like, when we consecrate ourselves to St. Joseph, it has effect. When we live lives of holiness, it has effect. It bears good fruit. So, for example, when uh, the same Pope, Blessed Pope Pius IX, declared Our Lady the Immaculate Conception in 1854, what happened four years later? You remember what happened four years later? Our Lady came to St. Bernadette Subiru and announced that she was the Immaculate Conception. Heaven responded to what the Pope did, and all of a sudden we get an apparition of Our Lady that becomes beloved by the whole Catholic world. Just four years after the declaration made by the Pope. Well, in 1870, the same Pope declared St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church. So what happened just nine years later? Just nine years later, St. Joseph came. Mary came. Jesus came depicted as a lamb on the altar, and even St. John the Evangelist came, St. John the Apostle. Where did they come? Knock Ireland, to Ireland. And it's, a, it's an approved apparition. No words were said, you know, uh, by any of the, uh, you know, by Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John. No words were said, but it was a very comforting apparition for it was 15 people. On, on a very rainy, rainy day uh, that saw this and testified to this. And this is fully approved. And, um, man, Facebook just went out again. I saw that flash. Sorry, guys. I hope that you're with me still. Yep. Somebody just wrote, darn devil. Yep. See, exactly. Ay, ay, ay. This is what happens, guys. It's unbelievable. My phone is like brand new. It should not be doing this. It's, it's crazy. 
So, um, and the reception where I'm at is like stellar. You couldn't get a better reception, you know? Um, so it was very comforting to the Irish people because they were going through a famine. So no words needed to be said. It was just a mother and father say, with St. Uh, John the Evangelist there to, to give them comfort during a very, very difficult time. I've been there twice, by the way, to the shrine in, in Ireland. Uh, I went, the last time I was there, I went with my mom and dad. That was a great trip going there with my mom and dad. So um, then after that, Our Lady came again to Fatima, but who also was at Fatima? St. Joseph. See, this is like the forgotten aspect of the Fatima apparitions. Sometimes it's mentioned in the books, but again, just like it is in the diary of St. Faustina or the you know story of a soul of Therese, it gets forgotten. People just read it and they're like, oh, that's so nice. And then they read the next page and like, back up, man. They're talking about St. Joseph here. Well, in the apparitions of Fatima, uh, the last apparition, which was on October 13th, 1917, that's the apparition where, you know, the miracle of the sun, where um, I think it was like 70,000 people saw the sun gyrating and looked like the whole cosmos, you know, was just going to blow up, um, witness this. That was at the same apparition that St. Joseph came holding the Christ child. And there, all the three children saw this, holding the Christ child, just like he is here. They together simultaneously blessed the world. That is huge, my friends. That is so huge. Because remember, Our Lady of Fatima, she's got a plan. She talks about that peace plan, the praying of the rosary to, to stop the war, to change history, to renew everything. And part of this plan is the blessing of our spiritual father. It's huge because Our Lady, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, she knew what was coming. The collapse, the pillars would be taken away. Fatherhood would be mocked, ridiculed. Even our spiritual fathers in the church, many of them would be falling into, into sins and even criminal activity. Horrible things. You know what I'm talking about. This stuff would be coming. And so St. Joseph's place in Fatima is huge. It is huge, my friends. As a matter of fact, Sister Lucia dos Santos, remember the longest lived visionary of the Fatima apparitions? She stated that the final battle between good and evil would be over marriage and the family. We're seeing that played out right now with people trying to redefine everything right now. Oh, we're seeing that played out. And heaven taught us on October 13th, 1917, that Jesus works miracles, gives peace, and blesses the world through St. Joseph. Huge. What St. Joseph's presence at Fatima also signifies is that a crucial component of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary which is a promise Our Lady made during the July 13th apparition to the three children, is for the world to receive the simultaneous blessing of St. Joseph and Jesus, Father and Son. When the church recognizes the blessing of St. Joseph's fatherhood, Jesus will reign in hearts and Mary's Immaculate Heart will triumph. That's why I've been saying we're not going to get the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary until we get this right. How could her heart be rejoicing and triumphant uh, when families are collapsing, it's not going to happen. This it's going to happen when we, we, this gets right. This is how you're going to correct everything: civilization, culture, everything, the good, the true, and the beautiful, law and order. All this stuff will be corrected when you get the family right, and especially when you get the father right. This is why, for the last century, we've seen a complete attack on the father, on his role, on his importance, big time, big time. Man, I wish that more people in the church would acknowledge this and see this and shout it out. To me, it is so clear. So clear. So heaven's not stopping. They keep coming. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead to one. Then we're going to go back in time. So let's jump ahead now to 1968. So really close to, our, to us, right? Many of you, you were around at that time. I was born four years later in 72, but this isn't long ago, right? There was a series of apparitions of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in Zaytun, a suburb of Cairo, Egypt. Did you know this? 
You can actually look this one up and you can actually see pictures. Yes, you can. After I'm done talking, Google, go to Google and find the pictures. You're going to be like, what? Why have I never heard of this? It's going to blow your mind what you're going to see. So the town of Zaytun, this is fascinating. Check this out. The town of Zaytun is believed to have been one of the places the Holy Family visited during their sojourn in Egypt centuries earlier. Now, I remember uh, that when, when I read about this during my Mariology studies, um, I was like, that's fascinating. I wonder why Egypt of all places. And then I remember uh, uh, in one book that I was reading about it, somebody said that this is most likely one of the towns that the Holy Family was in, maybe for a long period of time, but probably maybe a short period of time, because at that time it was kind of on, 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 the, on the route where if you, were, if you were a traveler, it would have been a place that you would have stopped. Well, check this out. Probably about, maybe about five years ago, maybe six years ago now, I was at a conference, and I mentioned this just in passing, the Zaytun uh, Egypt thing. After my talk and after I, you know, was me talking with people, this guy comes up to me, um, and he was, you know, he looked like he was Middle Eastern, and he says to me, Father, I can't believe that you, you, you mentioned this. And he goes, do you know where I'm from? Do you know where I'm from? And I'm like, no. He goes, I'm from Zaytun. That's my town. That's where I was born. And he goes, he goes, and my grandfather, my grandfather was alive when it happened and he testified to it. He told all of it to us and he told us, don't ever forget what happened. And he said, father, we who are from that town, we all know this has gone as part of our tradition from the time that it happened that this, it's not maybe one of the places that the Holy Family was. They were definitely here. He was telling me this, a man from the town. I was like, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I was so grateful to have met that man. Maybe he's watching tonight. I don't know. But God bless you, brother. That was such a, a great thing uh, for me when, when he told me that. So check this out. So um, incredibly, when it happened in 1968, thousands of the inhabitants of that town saw this. Not just Christians. It included Muslims, Jews, and government officials, even people who didn't believe anything. They saw this, and they got pictures of it. There's actually even video of it. The video is a little harder to find, and in 1968, you know, they didn't have some super high-tech thing. Uh, but it's you can di dig around. You will find it. It's absolutely amazing. Um, witness this. As at Knock, there were no words spoken and no messages given. The apparitions, the apparitions took place above and around a Coptic church and were approved by the local Coptic ecclesial authorities there. Wow. Isn't that amazing? All right. Now we're going to back up just a decade uh, about something really fascinating that uh, to me is extraordinary, really extraordinary. Perhaps the most significant of all St. Joseph's appearances in modern times were the alleged apparitions given to Sister Mildred Mary Nuziel. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name right there, but she also goes by the name Sister Mary Ephraim. That works. In the United States in the 1950s. 1950s, guys. So again, not that long ago. These apparitions are known as the apparitions of Our Lady of America. Maybe you've heard of those, right? Maybe you haven't. And there's updates that I'll be giving you uh, just since the book came out. So I'm going to read this little section here to you so I don't miss anything. I got some side notes, too, I, I, so I'll have to look at those to give you some, some other things. The alleged apparitions given to Sister Mary Ephraim occurred in Ohio. What? Uh, and took place over many years. Sister Mary Ephraim died in 2000. She only died 20 years ago. At the heart of the messages is a call to prayer, conversion, purity, Consecration to Our Lady as the Immaculate Conception and devotion to St. Joseph. And in 1956 and 1958, St. Joseph himself spoke to Sister Mary Ephraim. It's being unveiled. The silence is breaking. The mystery is about to reach its finale. Something, something. The messages of St. Joseph to Sister Mary Ephraim are extremely important for our times. The themes in it, everything I've just been telling you about the attack on fatherhood, the, the, the deconstruction of the family, and this all, all that we're going on right now, it's at the heart 
of what, what was conveyed in these messages. St. Joseph spoke to her of his virginity, purity, obedience, and love for his spouse. He also informed Sister Mary Ephraim that God desires that the world have a greater appreciation for the sufferings the heart of St. Joseph underwent in union with the hearts of Jesus and Mary. St. Joseph spoke of the importance of devotion to his heart and spiritual fatherhood, as well as how God desires to bless all fatherhood through St. Joseph. The recognition of the wonders of St. Joseph is of such great importance that St. Joseph instructed Sister Mary Ephraim that God wants St. Joseph to be honored on the first Wednesday of every month, especially by the recitation of the joyful mysteries of the rosary and the reception of Holy Communion. Fascinating. See, haven't we seen stuff like that before? When the church was going through difficult times and there were people who were uh, really you know, wandering away from the core teachings of the church. Uh, guys who, I won't get too technical here with certain movements and things, but there was this movement called Jansenism, and it was really <clears throat> a harsh spirituality that was just like so lacking in, in affection and tenderness and, and, and even, you know, talking about the mercy of God. It was just harsh. It was really, really intense. And a lot of people just felt that they couldn't live up to, to, to what probably God was asking of them. And they were just, they're sinners. And it was, they were being browbeat with this harsh spirituality. And then God, through St. Mary, Margaret Mary Alacoque, gave the Sacred Heart devotion. And we, we see this movement go, and it was a groundswell movement by the lady, and, and eventually the leaders caught on, and then we get a feast day, and then we get the first Friday, and all that stuff. You know, something similar with, with the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady, come, you know, through great saints talking about it, like St. John Eudes and, and many others, but then we, we, we get apparitions talking about it as well, like at Fatima, and we get, we get the first Saturday devotion to Our Lady. And now we've got allegedly St. Joseph talking about the first Wednesday. Now we're going to talk more about Wednesdays and their significance with St. Joseph uh, in just a couple days, uh, which is fascinating stuff. But see, the first Wednesday of the month, because the three hearts are, 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 are one, they're so united. Remember, we talked about the union of the two hearts for a while now. That's great. It's been wonderful. But now we need to bring in St. Joseph because the fatherhood has got to take up his rightful place in the family. How can we do this without leaving and leave St. Joseph out? How are we, how do we possibly think we're going to restore families when you leave out the head of the holy family? It ain't going to happen. That's why we got to bring him into this whole equation. We got, we got to close the gap. And that's why he's so important right now. So I'm so excited. I'm losing my place. <laughs> um, this is just so extremely important. That, um, you know, it can't be overlooked what what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do and wanting to emphasize. And that's why as part of this, um, you know, and I say alleged, right, because I'm not the magisterium and I'll give you the updates in a second. But the the desire to pray the joyful mysteries of the rosary on that first Wednesday, but at any time. Um, why? Why those? Because those are also the Joseph mysteries. Think about those mysteries, right? You've, you've got the Annunciation, you've got the Visitation, you've got the birth of our Savior, you've got the Presentation and the Finding in the Temple. Joseph is in all of those mysteries. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I get the, the, the other four, but the first one, how is St. Joseph in the Annunciation to Mary? He's not, he's not, he wasn't in that scene. How can we meditate upon him in that? Because it was his wife. Remember, he was married to her when the angel came. So don't leave them out, you know, bring them in to your meditation. Those are Joseph mysteries. The five joyful mysteries are Joseph's as well as our ladies. See, this is what heaven is screaming out to us. Pay attention, guys. Trying so hard to get you to, to, to acknowledge that there's a crisis, there's problems, the enemy is on the attack, and I'm giving you the weapons to use. I'm giving you you know, things to use to counterattack. Because remember, we shouldn't just be on the defensive. We need to be on the offensive. We need to be the ones hunting for souls. We need to be the ones who are, who are going out and, 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 and calling out the bad things and elevating the good things and seeking to renew through love, overcome through love. 
And that's why we've got, we've got these things. And, you know, there's a lot going on right now. And there, there's a lot of things that I could say. Um, but, you know, we're, we're at a spiritual battle right now. And I firmly believe that heaven is, is trying really to get through our stubborn hearts and heads uh, and teach us something vital right now. Vital right now. Okay, so I am not going to read all the messages. Um, there, you, you need to read them on your own. And because it covers three full pages, the ones that deal with St. Joseph, they are, mwah, oh, oh my gracious. It, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable because all the things that I've been talking about and that the saints have been talking about and that popes in the last 150 years have been talking about are, are in it, are in it. Just quick. I'm not going to read it. I'm not. I promised myself I wouldn't do that because it will be here all night. You need to read it. But the things that are majorly emphasized in here, I hope I can find it right now. Um, oh, where is it? I, I list them. Oh, it's me. Not uh, Yeah. So it's here. Um, oh, rats. I can't find it now. Eh, whatever. Um, I'll find it in a minute, I'm sure. Oh, here we go. Just found it. So the things that are highly emphasized in Joseph's words are his spiritual fatherhood, his virginal fatherhood, his youthful appearance, his kingship, his crown, his heart, and his cloak. These things are so important, guys. I can't tell you how important this stuff is. This is why I had these images like this commissioned. This is why this movement is so huge. This movement of consecration to St. Joseph is going to spark a renewal in the church. I am positive of this. I am positive of this. Man, if I had a megaphone the size of, 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 of the state of Rhode Island to just attention, attention to the whole world. Heaven is trying to get our attention. Now, I need to give you some updates because remember, I told you we're in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual battle right now. And we're in a spiritual battle for um, the role, true role of fatherhood, what the father should be. And, you know, you know I'll just, just tell you the things. So I'm not going to give too, com too much commentary on this. So today, and this will be time dated now that I'm going to say this, is uh, June, what is it, the 15th, I think, something like that. So just last month, May 7th, 2020, an official statement came out from the bishop in Indiana, and that was actually signed by four other bishops, I think it was four, um, where Sister Mary Ephraim lived at various times during her life. And this official statement says that they uh, could not uh, conclude that these alleged apparitions were of supernatural origin. And you can read the statement and, and feel free to. You, you can find it. Um, it's easy to find. So what does that mean? They classified it as subjective inner religious experiences. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, that's actually not the technical words that have classically been used, but um, we have to respect what they did. These are bishops and we are children of the church and we have to obey. We have to obey. Did they condemn it? No, they did not. This is very important for you to know. Because, uh, you know, if it were condemned, there's three categories where you can talk about after you do an investigation on an alleged apparition. I'm not going to give you their Latin titles. I don't want to get too technical. Actually, some of it's going to be we're revising that section of my book to be in accord with the bishop's statement so, because that we have to. We have to be obedient. But there's, there's going to be more things coming, and I'll tell you what I mean in a second. So the, the alleged apparition can either be outright condemned, which this one was not. It can be told that it is of supernatural origin, which means approved, or it can be said that it cannot be determined, basically at this time, that it's of supernatural origin. And that's where it stands on the statement about from that bishop and the other four who signed it, that it can't be determined if it's supernatural, but it's not condemned. So you cannot promote it or uh, practice it publicly. And there's a whole bunch I could go into there with there's a statue that's associated with it that Our Lady wanted processed in the Basilica in D.C. So that's not going to happen anytime soon because that's a public thing. But you can practice this devotion privately. That is actually in the letter from the bishop. And I'm, I'm grateful for that, um, that we can practice it privately. But we do have to understand that, um, you know, these things came through the alleged 
visionary, Sister Mary Ephraim, filtered through her own subjective consciousness and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they acknowledged that she was an extraordinary woman who lived an upright life and a virtuous life. Um, and there's something there. Even they said even more so than the average person would receive. Something extraordinary happened. And at this time, we can't determine that it's supernatural. But what that basically said, what, what they've left it open that possibly later, maybe it could be determined. A further investigation, maybe more evidence will come about. Uh, maybe something else will happen that they will be able to determine that. So that, to me, is, is actually a good thing because this is where I think that we could get theologians uh, who are specialized in this classic theology of understanding certain things about apparitions or about, you know, um, Josephology or Mariology. I don't know the particular Mariologist or Josephologist that the bishops uh, and their own people consulted. I kind of wish I did know their names because I actually know, uh, I think, the greatest Mariologist on the planet right now, around the world. I, I know them. And none of them have told me that this commission talked to them. So I, I find that fascinating. I also know, I think, that probably the leading Mariologists in the world. I have a licentiate Mariology. Um, the ones that I know never say that they were consulted. So I find that interesting. Um, and there's one particular thing about the statement that is intriguing. And I think is a cause for even more um, people to do doctorates. Remember in this uh, series, I've been talking about, hey, do a doctorate on this theme that I mentioned, or this quote from this pope or this saint. You know, I think so far I've I've commissioned somebody out there to do six doctorates already. I'm going to give you somebody a seventh one. Okay. So in their statement, they say that um, in one of the messages, alleged messages, that um, St. Joseph is referred to as the co-redemptor. Now, that's an interesting phraseology. Usually it would be called co-redeemer. Um, and they found that problematic. And they said that this appears to be an error. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I think maybe they're relying upon the historicity of the lack of use of that term in regard to St. Joseph uh, being something relatively recent. And they're right about that, um, unless we do discover things that have not been translated into English. Because, again, I don't know the Josephologists that this commission talked to or Mariologists, because a lot of these words in reference to Our Lady have been around for a long time. Uh, maybe with St. Joseph, we may just not be aware of it. Um, but regardless, regardless, um, there is a, 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 a theological uh, solidity and, and, and truthfulness to being able to call St. Joseph a co-redeemer. Because all you got to do is break it down to what it means, properly understood, and what it doesn't mean. Just like, you know, if, if we can call Mary Theotokos, right? Well, there's a way to properly understand it. She's the mother of God, but she's not... She didn't exist before God. She's not God. You know, she, she, she gave to God a human nature. Uh, but, you know, we have to understand it in the right way. And we've, we've worked through that, of course, right? And that was declared centuries ago, of course. But see, St. Paul talks about us being collaborators with Christ, cooperators with Christ. And, and he talks about us filling up what is lacking in the mystical body. Now, what could be... did? It, did, it, did Christ not do everything? Is he deficient? Of course not, right? But he continues that work of salvation in time through the mystical body of the church with our participation, with our cooperation, with our free will saying, fiat, be it done to me too. I want to cooperate. I want to, I want to be your vessel. I want to be one who, who helps bring about the, the rebirth of souls. And see, this is what Christianity is, is, is all about. So this is why we can legitimately call Our Lady co-redemptrix. Doesn't mean that she's God because she's not. Catholic Church has never taught that, never will. But did she cooperate with Christ? Oh, big time. And saints, scholastic saints talk about these distinctions of objective redemption and subjective redemption and, and the particular graces that she merited and, and certain things that she did not merit, like her own immaculate conception. Again, I don't want to get too technical here, but this is this is why you need you know, really, really well-read theologians who, who know the traditions and know what can be said and what cannot be said. And I have to say that Our Lady can be called co-redemptrix, and popes have said this about Our Lady, right? Um, 
Saints have said him. Tons of tons of Saints. Um, and there's a possibility that maybe that could be declared a dogma in the future. I don't know. I'll leave that up to God, right? I would like to see Our Lady defined as co-redemptrix because it means with the Redeemer, not the Redeemer. Mary is not the Messiah or the Redeemer or the Savior of the world. She cannot do anything of her own. She's a creature like you and me. But united with Christ, she's the new Eve, the mother of all the living. She's the one who cooperated in the most unique and, and particular way with Jesus in the salvation of the world. She is the co-redemptrix. Well, St. Joseph, the church is, remember, it's been building. It's We got a development of doctrine here with St. Joseph. There's something very truthful that can be said about St. Joseph because of his closeness to the hypostatic union. He's greater than the angels, no matter what choir. He's greater than all saints and all popes. That union of his heart with the heart of his bride, as Pope Leo XIII said, and we read uh, maybe two weeks ago, that union is so close that they share in a common mission. That makes him co-redeemer as well, with and under Christ. St. Joseph is not the Messiah. He's not God. He's not divine. Nobody has ever said this. That would be totally off to say that. But when you understand it the right way, this is what makes us too. Us, you and me, we can be co-redeemers in Christ. I mean, you know as well as I do, you ain't God. You ain't the Messiah. I don't care who you are who's watching this. You ain't, and neither am I. But God wants us to cooperate. And when we do, our suffering, the cross we bear, the, the things that we, we, we do, the penances that we do, the, the mortifications that we do, Christ will use these things to fill up what is lacking in his mystical body for the salvation of souls. So we cooperate. We co-redeem with and under Christ. This, my friends, is Theology 101. This is the basics of Christianity. So I think that this is room for further development and somebody to do a doctorate. This has really never been done before in the scholastic way of unpacking it, what it means and what it doesn't mean. And so if you write that doctorate, please, please, Give it to the commission because it's an opportunity. If good can come out of this, and I believe that it can, and again, we have to obey that statement that came out. We ha always have to say, you know, put things in their right place. We cannot go trumpeting things with false statements that are contrary to what the bishop said. This is our, our responsibility as children of the church. Yet, they've left it open. They've left it open. They haven't condemned it. So I find that fascinating. But what I'm about to tell you, you're going to find even more fascinating. But let me make sure that I didn't leave anything out here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I think we're good there. And by the way, in we've already revised the, the new edition. It's not printed yet, but um, we, we've revised it so that the things that I put in here are in conformity with the phrases that are used from the bishop's statement in the uh, next print run of the book, because we have to be obedient. We have to be children of the church. We don't go rogue. We don't do our own thing. Um, so we've conformed it to that statement. And in the next print run, which be coming up soon, uh, it, you'll, you'll find it. So, all right. Um, that now I want to tell you about this because this is fascinating. Check this out. Last week, I get a phone call from some friends of mine. Dave and Joan Maroney, they, uh, they, they have an apostolate that they uh, work with uh, the Marians in spreading divine mercy. And they called me up and they said, Father, are you aware of something going on with Our Lady of America? And I said, yeah. Well, you mean the, the statement from the bishops? And they said, no, no, no. Yeah, we, we know that. We know that. They said, but are you aware of a certain locutionist slash visionary? And I'm like, um, yeah, I've, I've heard of her name. What are you talking about? Well, this is what they told me. Now, before I say this, I want to preface this by saying this. I am not the Pope. I am not a bishop. I am not the magisterium. I don't know if this is true or false. I'm just relaying to you an update that I find interesting. We'll see where it goes. Um, so keep that in mind. I don't want to lead you astray in any way. I myself obey everything that the church tells me to. But here's something interesting. They say that at the beginning of this year, 2020, so remember, the statement that came out from the bishop 
And the other four who signed it, I think it's four. I hope it's four. I'm saying wrong. Whatever. You can find out. Um, that was came out in May, right? Now, last year, the bishop in Indiana, he did come out with a statement, but it was never publicized. Nobody knew about it, right? Not even I knew about it. And I was I was putting out this book and I was actually in contact with that same bishop, but I it was never revealed to me anything about this. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody in the public sphere knew about this other statement written out last year uh, by the bishop, but it wasn't publicized. I'm pretty sure with 100%, you know, uh, not possibility, but uh, proof or what, where, where I'm going with that, that nobody knew about this last year. So it was just kept there. They wrote it, but nothing was done. I think maybe it was because they wanted the maybe the other four bishops, this is my guess, maybe they wanted the other four bishops to take their time and look at their study, look at their investigation and uh, feel comfortable signing, you know, their name to the one that was came out in May last month. So nobody knew. Nobody knew about this. Well, early this year, there's a woman whom I know, I don't know well, um, who claims to have received locutions, which means she's you're hearing, and also visions of some kind in front of the statue of Our Lady of America. Our Lady of America is speaking again, allegedly, before the even May statement came out. Heaven knowing that it would come out, kind of, maybe, allegedly, started to communicate to another woman about the same stuff. Where's this going to go? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm just like telling you, I don't think it's done yet. Actually, I've talked to a ton of theologians around the world about this and all these developments. And uh, there's theologians right now that I know that are actually working on papers to talk about a lot of this stuff, about St. Joseph and about this whole development and about how he can be called a co-redeemer, and about how, you know, about the church's growth in this development of not only that issue, but tons of other things associated with St. Joseph. And then there's stuff associated with Our Lady of America, too, that that I don't know, because I know that in that whole movement, there have been different factions. There have been one group who's had documents and another, and somehow they didn't get along, and one group sued the other. I don't know all the details. I stay out of that drama, man. You know I mean? There's so much drama associated with some of this stuff. Sometimes I'm just like, uh, but, you know, somebody got to deal with it. I'm just glad that I ain't the one, but somebody got to deal with it. Well, we'll see what happens. Who knows? Maybe it'll come to nothing, my friends. Maybe it'll come to nothing. But nonetheless, the important thing to remember here is that the bishops did not condemn they did not condemn uh, the alleged apparitions. They simply said it was a subjective inner religious experience um, and of a high quality, they said. They left it open. Maybe the future it could be changed. And I think that now is the time to take advantage of actually what the bishops have done. In a certain sense, they've, they've given an opportunity to theologians, high caliber theologians, you know, to, to, to unpack it to do the research, dig in those libraries in Rome and around the world and, and, and unpack this stuff theologically. Because today people don't do theology like they used to. Today, a lot of people just do, you know, kind of historical theology. They just study some dude and they write a paper on what he did in the 16th century, which is cool, which is cool. But boy, we could use a lot more like dogmatic theologians, systematic theologians who really unpack this stuff from Thomistic foundations and I mean, you, you, you can do such wonders. We're lacking in this today. We're lacking in this today. People oftentimes today in you know Catholic institutions studying for doctorates, they're studying trees, bro. Or they're talking about just about ecology. Now, okay, fine, 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 right? But we need to get back to how they used to do theology. I mean, breaking it down, distinctions, making distinctions, making distinctions. And that's good. Even if you don't come to the conclusion that you want it. And I say this of myself. The truth, veritas, is what we've got to get to. And I think that we've got an opportunity here in this latest development uh, of this particular alleged apparition to do some serious theological work. We do. So if any of you, again, are theologians, maybe take this up. Maybe take this up. Okay, my friends. So I'm going to leave it at that, I think. And I'm going to beg you. I am. I'm going to beg you. Because as I said, I did not read those three pages to you in the hard copy. 
It's from page 196 to 198. Those are the alleged words of St. Joseph to Sister Mary Ephraim. Read those. Read those. Read it twice. If you don't have the book yet, get the book. Simply for those three pages, my friends. What St. Joseph allegedly says to this sister is mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. And it's coming. You can't stop it. It's coming. All right. So let's pray the litany of St. Joseph. And today we're praying it in English because yesterday we prayed it in Latin. Okay, and that's on page uh, 233 in the hard copy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for St. Joseph, the pillar of families. We pray that more men would seek to imitate him in that vocation of being a pillar and that more priests would seek to imitate him as well in their spiritual fatherhood. As we see the collapse of marriages and families and civilization, Heavenly Father, we cry out to you in this urgent time, asking you, reveal St. Joseph to us. Show us St. Joseph. Let us know him. Let us champion him. Let us proclaim his greatness and the truthfulness of him. Speak, Father. Send your prophets. Send to your people a message so needed for our times. We beg you for this grace because we're in trouble. We're in trouble, Father. And we need, we need this example. We need the importance to know that our suffering is not wasted in a world filled with so much pain and sorrow that we too can cooperate with Jesus Christ and his mystical body, the church, that by our sufferings, the crosses that we bear, that we can imitate our Lord, that we can be like Our Lady and St. Joseph and the saints and be collaborators and cooperators in the mystery of salvation. Father, reveal this mystery to us because it's so needed today to renew the church and to renew the world. And we ask all of this, as always, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And my friends, may Almighty God bless you, your families, and especially for the conversion of loved ones. The blessing of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. All right, my friends, remember, Ite Ad Yosef, go to Joseph. God bless you all, and we'll see you tomorrow.